Good evening to you and, and welcome to this episode of Maternity and Midwifery Hour. This is our fifth session. It feels as though it's a lot quicker than that. We've, we've done so many sessions and it's been fantastic. Um, as you know, this is provided by Matt Flicks, which is video streamed from the Midwifery Experts. And this is the best place for your CPD and revalidation needs. And if you've actually got any students that need some materials, there's loads there to, to choose from. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this midwifery hour. Uh, my name's Sue MacDonald. I'm the curator, which sounds very good, of the Maternity and Midwifery Festivals and this hour. And it's my pleasure to be here with two wonderful speakers who uh, uh, I couldn't dream for the getting the best for this particular topic. The topic is regulatory perspectives, how students and midwives can be supported through the COVID-19 crisis. And I'm joined by Dr. Jackie Williams, Senior Midwifery Advisor at the in Education Standards Directorate at the Nursing and Midwifery Council, and Nikki Clark, Chair of the Lead Midwife, a Chair of the Lead Midwife for Education Strategic Reference Group who is an LME, very senior LME and head of midwifery and child health at the University of Hull. So I'm delighted you're, you're able to be with us. Thank you so much for coming to join us. And the first thing we usually start the evening with is a, little, a quick moment of the week. So Jackie Williams, would you have a moment of the week that you'd like to share with us? Or have you lost Jackie? Jackie's frozen. Oh, come well, maybe Nikki. Do you have a moment of the week? <laughs> and I hope we can get Jackie fairly soon. And so do I. And <laughs> I think it's hearing from my midwifery team uh, the, the reactions of the students to the restorative sessions that they're doing and how they are embracing our online learning and the support, support and supervision that they're receiving. And that just makes me feel very reassured. Okay, it's the essence of being a teacher, I think, isn't it? It is. Fabulous, fabulous, thank you. Now, have we got Jackie back from wherever she's frozen to? I'm hoping, I'm hoping she can return to us by voice, if not face. Oh, I think we'll have, we'll have to just, what we'll do is carry on. Sorry, carry on. We'll just we'll just uh, move on a little bit. We we will return. I know that there's some feverish activity to find out where Jackie's escaped to, um, so that we can have her here. So I'll just this is what we're doing. And this midwifery hour, we we aim, aimed this session really because, as you know, we've been doing the midwifery festivals for some time. And we weren't able to do that because of the COVID-19 crisis. So we really wanted to provide manageable and digestible information up to date to help midwives and student midwives and other people supporting women, babies and families at this time. Um, and so this is where the hour came from. And we, that's why we've gone for the middle of the week, seven to eight, and it's all available on a podcast and live on Facebook, and it will be available through Matflix after this day. So you, you've got access to all the materials. This is fantastic for your CPD. Hopefully, if you're doing revalidation, remember that. And um, I'd just like to, as I always do at this point, is just pause to remember the people that we've lost. These are, this is just, as I say, just this is the health, health and social care workers that have been lost over the last few weeks and if we think about the thousands of other people who we've lost over the weeks so most people will have been affected will have lost someone they love a friend a family member a partner and i just would like to say we're thinking about you and our thoughts and our prayers are with you and especially obviously with our midwife colleagues but actually everybody. It's a very difficult time and I don't think we can forget that at this point. And so we'll sort of say thank you to all the NHS and the key workers 
and their families and their friends because <laughs> the families and friends do do part of the support as well and what we put the nhs but that that includes just about everybody from the people at the supermarkets to the lorry drivers that supply supermarkets to the the, the um, bin men to everybody who keeps the world going thank you to them and I have to say it's the year of the nurse and the midwife WHO in the year of the nurse and the midwife and this is the NMC century of caring also that's being celebrated it's a it, this is what the, the year started with, even though we've been affected by COVID. Uh, some news, mainly in the news for me and mainly in my experience of this week has been the International Day of the Midwife, which was only yesterday. And, and it was such a fantastic day and such a positive day to be a midwife. Loads of Twitter activity, loads of Facebook activity, lots of local activities, as well as the international and national um, conferences that were available and presentations. I've put some of these uh, links on a resource page so you can access them. We had a midwifery forum yesterday. We had some fantastic speakers talking leadership, leadership voices. It was a fantastic day. And we had the lovely Roy Lilly and Jess Phillips MP. We had Professor Mary Renfrew and Professor Le Leslie Page and Professor Sue Down, plus the team from the Practicing Midwife, which was Anna Abiram and Claire Feely. And also we had loads of fantastic video clips too. So it was a really exciting day and lots of material to think about. So if you if you attended yesterday and you're due your revalidation, you better get recording your reflections now because you'll forget all the deliciousness that was there. There was also the Virtual International Day of the Midwife. And again, I've put the link on the resource page so you can act activate that as well. And you will notice on this slide, as well as the International Day of the Midwife poster, there's also some cake. Now, I'm afraid this is virtual cake for good reasons. <laughs> Everybody at the moment seems to be baking bread and cakes and scones and cream cakes. And I thought what we need here is some International Day of the Midwife cakes, but virtual cakes. So we don't put on weight and we can feel virtuous all the way through it. So there's your virtual cake. Now we've, we know that the maternity services have continued over the COVID um, crisis because obviously women still need antenatal care. They still need postnatal care. They need the care during labor and birth. And those mothers and babies still need their care and they and their families need support. And therefore, this is at the heart of today's session, we needed more midwives. Shielding, sickness and self-isolation meant we needed more staff. And also, I think there was a need to prepare just in case we needed even more. Mm. So I know that, that Jackie is going to talk a lot more about this, but invited midwives who left or retired to re-register. We wanted to make sure we had students, senior students who could come and do some practice on a different kind of ratio and think about other impact on the clinical placements and the university learning and teaching. So without further ado, we have got the return of Jackie Williams, which is fantastic. Yes. Welcome back, Jackie. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I just got to the point of asking what your moment of the week was, but maybe you could, maybe you'd like to start off your session with that. Um, and what I'll do is just introduce you in a formal sort of way. Jackie is Dr. Jackie Williams, Senior Midwife Advisor in Education, Education Standards Director at the NMC. People know Jackie very well. She's often to be seen and she's got a heart that's very clinical as well as regulatory, which is fantastic. Very experienced midwife and academic. And she's had 30 years, I can't believe 30 years at all. And as an academic, she's <laughs> continued to keep her links with midwifery practice and a passionate about the unique role of the midwife and women's centered care. And her role at the moment is, or was, to support the implementation of new <laughs> midwifery education standards. But I think it might have got a little bit um, adjusted in the last few weeks. And interestingly, her doctoral work 
researched whether resilience develops or not in student midwives as they navigate the undergraduate midwifery program. And that might well be very useful for your talk now. So over yes. to you, Jackie. Thank you. Uh, okay. Again. Good evening, everybody. Uh, apologies, this, the internet seems to be a little bit unstable this evening. Uh, what I want to talk to you about is some um, regulation. I'm, um, I'm particularly pleased to talk to you the day after the International Day of the Midwife. Um, it was a very special day, to, and I would actually say that probably was the highlight of my, my week. I, I think it's always a very special day, but I think maybe people really pushed out yesterday. We all were wearing yellow and trying to feel joyous in this very difficult time. And it was a very different day because the world continues to face these challenges of COVID-19 um, to our practice and to the women and newborn babies in our care. So what I want to say at this point is the NMC, the Nursing and Midwifery Council of the UK, absolutely recognises the important role and contribution that all midwives and student midwives are playing at this time. And we want to thank you. So um, as a result of the um, COVID-19 pandemic, um, a Coronavirus Act of 2020 made some amendments to our order. And the NMC worked with government and stakeholders to put in place particular measures uh, for nurses, midwives and nursing associates, as well as nursing and midwifery students. I will just say at this point, there, were, there are some conditions for people who join the, the temporary register. And one of that is that they have to work under the direction of an NMC registered nurse, midwife um, or other healthcare professional who's not on the temporary register. So the temporary register was, uh, is about trying to get more people into practice and making it more straightforward for them to do so. Obviously, we have to be assured that they are fit to do so. And um, it is only a temporary register and it will fall when um, legislation um, uh, dictates that the emergency is over. So some of the normal registration requirements don't apply. And one of them is the um, they don't need to uh, have satisfied revalidation requirements or pay a fee, but they absolutely have to follow our code while they're on the register. And we can remove individuals or groups from that temporary register. And the sort of um, uh, registrants uh, we were looking for were people who'd left the register up to three years ago and four to five years ago, but did exclude anybody who had any FTP concerns. And one of the other things that we did was that overseas nurses and midwives who had undertaken the online test, but were just waiting to sit the OSCE in order to uh, join our full register, were also given the opportunity to join the temporary register. So what this did really was uh, raise the number of registrants available to support our NHS and our social care system during this crisis. We also um, did some further measures. So at the moment there is uh, some flexibility in relation to revalidation and retention on the register as well as fitness to practice hearings and appeal hearings being online. So there's been a number of things that's tried to uh, reduce the burden of some of the things that we have to do within our statute. Um, the other thing we did, which was a major part of this work, was to look at our programme standards for our programmes of nursing and midwifery. And obviously this, this evening I want to particularly talk about those for midwifery students. And the aim for this was the educational institutions who are approved by us to run our programmes together with their practice learning partners. We wanted to give them much greater flexibility to enable the final year students. So those are the students in their final six months to be in practice. However, 
there are some key principles during this period that student midwives will continue as student midwives. So we want them to be supervised. And I've had a lot of conversations with people about what it is to directly or indirectly supervise students, because we recognize these students are in a, a very critical period of their program. And they've already got a lot of skills and proficiencies and they're not far off becoming registered. So they need to develop that confidence as well as their competence. So while they're being supported by their practice supervisor, they perhaps don't need so much direct supervision, but they also are going to come across things that they absolutely need full support and be directly supervised in terms of the care they're giving to women and babies. And our fundamental principle that during this time they continue as students meeting their confident competence, developing their midwifery skills and using their practice assessment documentation. But one key change is that they're not supernumerary. And um, some of this has been part of the um, restrictions and requirements because they will be paid during this time. Um, so what, but whilst not being supernumerary, they will have protected learning time and they will, some of them will still need to complete their theoretical components. But our absolute ambition is that they will register as a midwife on time whilst um, contributing uh, so much to the maternity services. So the reason we wanted them to do this, and one of the things we asked them to do is that they could be in practice for this um, final six months. And so we removed the requirement for them to have this 50-50 split between their practice and their theory. And um, so we recognised that it meant that they possibly would have more time in practice than 50 percent um, than they would have done um, before this crisis. And of course, all their learning outcomes need to be met. So there's been a lot of work looking at what placements these students need. And I will just say at this, this, this point is that whilst we recognise the value of, of these students continuing on their programme, as well as the contribution they're going to make, we had to be very clear that this was an individual decision. Because for some students, they were not, it wasn't possible for their own personal reasons or their personal health um, for them to actually be in placement at this time. Um, protected learning time was a very key principle um, and it was important that the students still got the support and the supervision to carry on learning during this period. And so this term protected learning time recognises that there should be opportunities made for them to learn while they're undertaking this final placement. Um, the other thing that we also had to consider, because that was the, uh, the third years and then the second years were also have the opportunity to be in practice um, from our point of view, although I'm sure um, uh, Nikki will come on to talk to them about perhaps some of the challenges the second years, um, perhaps uh, that has to be considered. But we had to think about the first year student who perhaps had had very little, if any, practice time at the moment. They needed a lot of support and that could have been challenging for our practice supervisors at this time. So one of our emergency standards was to ensure that first years continued on the programme, but they would spend 100 percent of their time in academic learning. Um, that doesn't preclude them doing voluntary paid work or perhaps being maternity support workers as they would have done anyway, but none of that can be counted towards their pre-registration programme. So they are 100% in theory in terms of their programme. The other change that we made in 2018 was to our supervision and assessment standards. And interestingly, a lot of midwifery programmes, although they haven't adopted the new, um, haven't had their new programmes approved for the new pro programme standards, which were launched last autumn, 
many had actually already adopted these new standards. So we made this an emergency standard. So anybody who had not gone through that process with their programs um, could adopt those standards. Um, and the reason for doing this is the fundamental difference with these standards for supervision and assessment is it gives the opportunity for any registered um, or healthcare professional to supervise midwifery students where that hadn't been the case with our earlier standards. So again, these emergency standards try to give much more flexibility to supporting students on their programme during this time. The other thing that is um, a slight change is in the new uh, standards of supervision, um, we've been very clear that a different person must supervise the student to the person who assesses them. And that was through uh, our quality assurance uh, feedback that we needed to make those two, two roles quite distinct. But for the period of time this emergency standards is in place, exceptionally, the same person may fulfill this practice and supervisor and practice assessor role. And again, we wanted to remove the additional burden on the workforce at this time, while still ensuring appropriate support and assessment of our students. So to all of our students, um, I wanted to thank you for those of you who have actually taken up this extended placement, whether you be in the third year or the second year. We are absolutely committed to you continuing on the programme. We want you to complete as near on time as possible, whilst you're still making an important contribution to maternity services. But for those of you who were not able to opt, opt in, we also under, fully understand that decision. It was right for you and your own personal circumstances. And just be reassured that you will return to practice in due course and get every support to become the midwives of the future. So I'll just thank, thank you at that point. And uh, I think, Sue, we're going to come back to questions. Yes, we are. Thank you very much, Jackie. <laughs> Especially given your technical IT problems, or not IT, the web. Yeah. You can imagine lots and lots of people are accessing Zoom and Skype at the moment. So yeah. it's hitting the, the technology a bit, a bit different. The only thing I was, I hadn't sort of, struck me before but it's the, it's the first years um i wonder how many students we might lose and this might be a, a something for nikki to to respond to at a later point because one of the things about being a new student is you really crave that clinical yeah, yeah. taste and i wonder how that's going to influence those first years when they're they're in the university setting i mean mm. i guess nowadays you have all these practices practice labs and that sort of thing but it's not the same mm. as meeting real real women with real babies and real families that is yeah. it's just something that's trickling in my brain really i mean i think it's something to watch you know we're beginning to hear a little bit of that but obviously it's far too early to tell um mm. I, mean, I have to say the ais have done a you know, incredible job to turn programs around to deliver that theory um, I think if anybody's listening and feeling a little bit uncertain, you know, you will catch up, you know, it will, you know, it will sort itself out. But I think at the moment, it's, it's a better place to be because it just reduces that burden of supervision and assessment for our maternity services. But I think the picture, uh, Sue, is changing, you know, and um, our chief midwifery officer yesterday, um, during International Day of the Midwife is saying, you know, where services had stored, they're always already going back to, to as they were. So, you know, I think it's something that, you know, we will keep under review as I'm sure the AEIs will. Um, and I think if there was any change, you know, uh, that will be, they'll be thinking about obviously the first years very much, but I think it was the right thing to do mm. at that time. Um, but of course, you know, I think the other thing uh, just to mention is the AEIs they don't have to adopt those emergency standards. So, you know, it is a it is a picture which is slightly variable around the, the, the four countries in the UK. And I mean, if at all possible, you know, but I think those emergency standards were in place to give 
AI's flexibility should they need to make these adjustments. That's great. Thank you so much, Jackie. And, uh, I'm sorry that you had all the hassle and well done for keeping keeping going and we've got your presentation because it, it works out very well. And just to say, if you're just joining us, and this is the Maternity Midwifery Hour, and we're delighted we have Jackie Williams from the NMC and Nikki Clark from the University of Hull looking at how regulatory changes have been designed to support students and midwives through COVID-19. So I am thrilled that we have a second speaker standing by. We're hoping that we're not going to have any problems with the, the dreaded internet. Um, and it's Nikki Clark who's the chair of the Lead Midwife for Education Strategic Reference Group, LME. She's also an LME and head of midwifery and child at the University of Hull. Very experienced midwife because in order to be, for those of people who don't know who are joining us from around the world, each university will have a Lead Midwife for Education. And that person is the most senior, and most experienced midwife educator. So we're thrilled to have Nikki. So welcome, Nikki. The floor is yours now. Or the screen is yours, actually. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much for asking me to talk about this. Um, as an LME group, um, I'm sure you can imagine, we have been in uh, quite a flurry of activity, <laughs> for want of a better phrase, um, as have all our midwifery teams. And all I can say is that from a united response across the four countries, it has been phenomenal. So yes, we are working with the changes to regulation um, and it is working across four countries. Uh, the NMC is the UK wide regulator um, and the emergency standards are applicable to all four countries. So there are some differences and that is what we're finding. And so places, in, you know, different places are in different stages. And there are some, um, some areas where there are cross-border students that either live on one side, work in another, and those sorts of things. But how I will come across that. But the management of education training, say, does have four leaders, really. So England is Health Education England. Wales is Health Education Improvement Wales. Scotland is NHS Education for Scotland and Northern Ireland is Department for Health and Personal Safety and Social Services. So um, application of the standards UK wide is exactly as Jack has just said, it, it is a choice of the university and it is also the responsibility of each individual university as to how they apply the standards to their programmes. It has to be done obviously working in partnership with local trusts because um, that is the nature of how we are. Our students, you know, it's 50% theory, 50% practice. So any change to the programme has to be with um, partnership. And that is one very positive spin-off from this is how close partnership working we have experienced with our practice partners, meeting with the heads of midwifery weekly for many of us, if not more often to discuss our students who are central to all decisions that are made with this um, change. Obviously we are receiving guidance from our governments um, and across all different countries. So again, there are some slight differences amongst that, but many similarities. So when the emergency standards were um, released very quickly, I would say, so well done Nancy, and on the 31st of March, uh, they came in very rapidly and we were very responsive, I think, as an LME group um, to look at our programmes very quickly. We moved to online delivery of all theory almost overnight and I cannot underestimate or so even begin to say how difficult that was um, but it was done and it was done with gusto and it was done with passion uh, we obviously had to look at program assessments every program in every institution runs slightly differently it has different timelines they're all three years but some start at different points some have different um, semester times so we were all in different stages but it was looking at how we could work with where we were with our own program the job description was an interesting one for our year threes because the when the job description did come out but it was always advised that we knew we believed it would be band four uh, band four in midwifery 
isn't a, a purse that exists even though it is being looked at going forward. And um, so that made it problematic because they weren't quite sure what a band four did, um, but there are band fives obviously and band twos and threes. But we were very clear and the NMC were very clear. And this is where it was very, very helpful was that we did have a direct steer from the NMC that the job description was that of a student midwife. These are student midwives and they are to graduate and complete on time by undertaking all the responsibilities and, and the competencies and the practice that you would expect of a senior student midwife. So that made it quite clear when we were discussing with our practice partners and they are very, very supportive. And then, of course, came the Trust and Health Board contract. And I will come back to that because that is still an ongoing saga for some places. So looking at the emergency standards, it is the choice of the AI to adopt. We are quite clear that the program requirements still to be met. Uh, what they did do, the emergency standards, was they allowed us to be flexible and it, it made such a difference to be able to think like what is best as opposed to what the standards say. So because when you're developing a programme, the, 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 the standards for um, curriculum development are quite clear, uh, very boundaried, and we all work within them. So suddenly when there was flexibility, it made things to develop with the students central to this better. We could just say, well, we could just move that assessment to there, we could move that practice to there, we could do this theory like that. And suddenly we could start looking at how our programme could be delivered better. It ensured that students could be appropriately supervised and supported, looking at where they were in the programme. It was quite clear the temporary register is not open to student midwives. Uh, Supernumerous status, if we adopted the student, if they opted in, then the supernumerous status is revoked um, and there were clear options for students. And they are to continue as normal, but the question um, in the clinical areas was, was supernumerous status achievable, which is as Jackie said, um, and that is something that the HUD, when we had our discussions with our practice partners was, we had to be honest, can this be achieved? And the majority said it can't be achieved. Um, so then the option is to defer, um, defer and work for the trust another role or to opt in. So we're proceeding with the emergency standards and first years are in theory, quite clear, um, and all at a distance. And in answer to your um, question or your comment, Sue, um, our first years are very, very, very enthusiastic. And mm. um, they did us a very, very nice video to sort of say that they missed us, which was nice, and they appreciated the support. Um, but they understand that we are there for them and we are doing the best that we possibly can. And that they will be out in practice, they will complete their programme. Second years um, are the theory and are paid placements. Again, if they are second years, some second years are at different stages because programmes are organised slightly differently. Modules are done at different times. Students are taught things at different times. So um, for some students, you had to ask the question again to our practice partners, could they be appropriately supervised? And if we felt that we weren't assured that they could be appropriately supervised, then we have a duty care to, to protect our students. And so if we feel that they need to be in theory until we can review the situation um, and things change, then that is what we will do. And many have done that. Uh, for third years, um, for the final six months of the programme, it's opt in or opt out. And the opt out is for all the reasons that Jackie said and fully understandable lots of pressures um, for students with the homeschooling, not vulnerable people at home, they have to shield for themselves, absolutely clear, very sensible and very professional. Um, to opt in, um, again, uh, we are very grateful and the service is very grateful, it's an extended paid placement, there are different models again going around the UK, looking at the different countries, looking at the different regions, uh, what we think that we have agreed with our heads of midwifery is that the programme outcomes can be met because it is crucial to the midwifery workforce that our students, our family students, complete on time to be midwives because that's what has been determined that we need midwives and um, we was in the throes of a midwifery expansion project 
And so we know we need our midwives and so we really must facilitate them graduating on time. Uh, the, the change with the um, restriction on the strict 50-50, so flexibility with theory and practice hours has really been helpful. Uh, must complete the 4,600 hours by the end of the programme and of that 2,300 must be evidence in theory, 2,300 in practice and all programme requirements must be met. There is no shortcuts. That is a professional requirement. This is a regulated programme and we need midwives who are safe and competent. And that is what we will, our, our students deserve that of us and of the placement areas. And that is what we will do. The transfer to the SSSA, Again, many areas in the country, in the UK, are, were in different stages with this. Wales hadn't um, uh, moved across at all. Their plan was for next year. So this was something new for the practice areas. Um, some some programmes had done year one, some, some programmes had done all three years. Um, so again, very different. As an LME group, we have discussed this, we, we've talked it through, we've met with our practice partners. And I would say, by and large, this has been accepted very readily. It has been welcomed and it has really helped. Uh, the 40% with the mentor is now no longer required. So that has actually freed up so students can work with different people and learn from different people. And the practice supervisor and practice assessor can be the same person um, for this interim period. Um, many people say, well, what does supervised status actually mean? I mean, Jackie talked about the direct and indirect, and there's, there's um, many stages, and we have a, a new document that's been developed in midwifery that will be a common assessment document, and the MORA, uh, the Midwifery Ongoing Record of Achievement, will be adopted across England and Northern Ireland. Um, which is quite clear really how these students do as they progress through the programme, their um, uh, supervision levels will actually decrease because they can increase in proficiency and confidence and this allows it. So this is the supporting information from the triple SA. I think I, it epitomises exactly what we are doing now with our students. So they are given opportunities and space to take responsibility for their own learning and to seek out learning experiences and develop their own practice without compromising public safety. That has to be still the first and foremost principle. The level of former practice supervision can decrease or change with the students increase in proficiency and confidence. Very easy to work with with that one. Um, so what's going well? Um, I would say the move to online learning. It's, it's going well. It's, um, everybody's had quite a steep learning curve <laughs> using different platforms, using different methods. It is extremely resource intensive, but I would honestly say the enthusiasm that has been shown and demonstrated uh, with this has just been fabulous. Uh, there's been innovative teaching and learning strategies and as I say both students and lecturers are enjoying their new learning. Student support and communication appears to be going well across the board. We had a meeting this morning with all of our LMEs with Jackie and with the Council of Deans and we're talking about how we communicate with students and things and the feedback that we are getting back is by and large this is this is going okay and um, somebody might tell me differently but we feel it's going okay our students tell it's going okay we get feedback and there is um you know access to the middle of supervision in wales and scotland and uh, pma service in england uh, and that seems to be working really well where it's been implemented first year um sorry okay first year through in theory until the next academic year and three years and um, who are opting out um opting in, sorry, will get a ban for paid placements with contract protected learning time. So that seems to be all working out. There are some difficulties with um, contracts. So the, what isn't going so well is the inconsistencies and um, students um, are being in practice. Some are still in practice, some are being taken out of practice at different times. That's causing students anxiety because they're thinking they might have to make hours up because they are so clear that we have to um, know every hour. Um, there, has been, there has been a delay with job descriptions. Uh, there has been a delay with contracts. There has been IT issues for students at home. Um, but again, there are systems that can help with that. And again, with second years, inconsistency of approach. 
I'm trying to speed up now because I know I'm running out of time. Um, so reconfiguration of the maternity services also has affected some placement provision. But by and large, I say home birth rates are going up um, and the MLU service. So but anxiety is something that we have experienced. Um, practice suddenly become a very scary place for some people. There are pressures at home, care responses, home, home schooling. Death in service is now being talked about, which is causing concern. It is always something that with any job, this is a, a, that's talked about with life insurance and the things, but it's suddenly being talked about very openly and that's causing a lot of anxiety. Ensuring the document can be completed on time, that the programme will be completed on time. Safety simulation before real practice and of course assessments. Um, you, most universities have issued a no detriment policy to mitigate against the circumstances. So again, discuss with your own university, but we understand as educators, we understand these issues and we are here to support you. Moving forward, we will continue to support our students um, to ensure they do complete on time. Support practice partners with um, to support supervision and assessment of students. It is a new process for some areas and we're working with that. We will reevaluate the situation in the clinical areas and um, to facilitate our students to achieve in practice. We are realigning assessments and then we will have bespoke planning to ensure students can complete on time if they have opted out, because I know they are concerned, they are anxious and we have to plan ahead if remote learning continues long term. Quick positives, successful transition, strong communication channels, strength of the LME executive group and close collaboration between the four countries. Um, students report positive practice experiences. They feel valued. Um, they are central with all decisions. They tell us they feel supported. Students tell us they miss us. And I would like to tell them that we miss them. <laughs> And that's the thing to celebrate our students, but I don't think I've got time. But anyway, thank you very much. And sorry for the whistle stop. And my dog's just entered the door. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki. That was fantastic. <laughs> and I think I think the whistle stop tour shows and for both both speakers actually illustrates the amount of work that's had to go on. And it is like the swan with the little feet going on underneath for both both sides. The NMC have, have moved very fast with the regulatory tools, which look quite straightforward. They look as though they were quite easy to do, Jackie, really. <laughs> <laughs> Not. Walk in the park. Walk in the park. <laughs> because, because these things aren't easy because you have to get agreement. You have to think about the, the, the long term sequelae for all these things. And certainly Nikki in talking about organizing students and organizing programs and getting all of the program online that's a huge huge task and to make sure the students feel supported and looked after and as though they, they're going to still be student midwives and still finish is so important i think that that was really so well illustrated it is work in progress so you know we've, we've still got a long way to go we are still doing absolutely you know, the collaboration is there the willingness is there the enthusiasm the motivation i can't underestimate i'll tell you how how empowering that is when everybody is pulling in the same direction and I think that's one of the thing, the positive things about the COVID crisis that's been coming all the way through, like a little thread all the way through, has been the sort of togetherness that it's brought midwives and others in the, the multidisciplinary team and students. Everybody's sort of pulling together and understanding if there are problems. So that's been fantastic. The and other I thing... I take credit, Sue, that obviously the NMC didn't do this alone. <laughs> no, no, no. But but I think that's, that's yeah. the whole point. It is. It's the togetherness. Yeah. And that, that really does illustrate it brilliantly. And the nimbleness that, that has gone on. The sort of fast, fast footwork that's gone on now we're all supported by IAIs I can't underestimate either the support that we've had from our institutions to allow oh, us to adopt our programs to change assessments to move modules around that's not usually done very easily no, it isn't. but we have been given that flexibility because we have provide assurance we are robust in our decision making we are robust in, in our rationale uh, and and the outcome is has to be a positive one because we must evidence a competence. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And make sure that we've got plenty of student midwives becoming midwives yes. because we can't forget we're still around 3,000 short. Mm -hmm. So the more we're getting through, the better. We don't want to lose any on the way. Now, I'm going to move us on to question and answers now because I've got my little phone and I've been having little questions coming through. Okay. Some of which, some of which I think I might, I might know the answer to. Um, oh, a minute, it's gone. Hang on. One uh, comment from Jane Marshall, who hi. says, "Hi Jane, <laughs> hi Jane," <laughs> who says it's very exhausting for academic staff, but we're hoping to go forward. We can utilise these online approaches as a university. So that's that's great. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and Virginia Cummins is saying, I'm due to start my midwifery training in September 2020. Do you know or think that there will be, uh, oh, it's, it's gone horrid, sorry. No, there'll be a knock-on effect. We discussed that this morning, actually. That was one of the um, things that we are obviously mindful of. Uh, and at the, answer, at the answer is we don't know at the moment. We, we hope not. We are, that was one of my planning ahead, is to see where we are. Obviously, the priority will be to get our um, students completed for the third years, to ensure the second years can make up their practice hours um, with the placement areas. And obviously, our first years need to be out there as well, because that is what they'll come in to do. Um, so it, it, it should delay them. It, we, we will have a period of readjustment. There, there is no doubt about that. There will be a period of readjustment. What that will look like, we don't know because we don't know when this crisis and the emergency yeah. measures will continue. Yeah. Um, so I mean, from our point of view, Sue, I mean, uh, new programmes are still going forward to approval mm. uh, to adopt our new standards from September 21, uh, 2020. Others will um, go for the approval later, but I mean, programmes will need to continue to run. But I think um, we're just really thinking about the current crisis in that six months mm. when these emergency standards in and when they fall. And obviously there is some, um, but there will be a lot of discussion as we get nearer to the autumn term. You know, the yeah. ARs will have to make those some of those decisions. And of course, on a... On a um, and one note, you know, we're hearing already the birth rate is potentially going to increase. Yes. <laughs> so we absolutely need our new <laughs> Well, Frank, Frank Akade, the uh, president of the ICM, said that yesterday on one of her presentations that all these people being at home, the inevitable effect is the birth rate's going, going to go up. Yep. <laughs> so that, that's... Oh, uh, I still get their births in. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess the, 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 the lady who asked that maybe it's thinking that because i know that the competition to get places to get a place in midwifery is still very difficult but i guess we can reassure her that the place will be there but there may be a delay in the next in, in, input it's just hard to say in. yeah you have to just watch this space okay now there's a question uh, uh, uh right what now sarah Kof Kofet? says, can I ask about third years who are still trying to caseload women to meet the NMC requirements? Uh, da, da, da. As they're not, oh, it's, I think, I think she's asking if, if, yeah. you, if you can make one thing your task. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, in terms of, uh, I mean, for those standards that she's talking about, which is the 2009 standards, we don't say how that case loading has to be carried out. That's absolutely for an AI decision to be made. Um, we don't stipulate numbers. Um, so I, you know, I'm I'm reassured that you know the AIs will still ensure that they meet that, but it might be perhaps in a slightly different way to perhaps what's been tendered. Do you want to come in, Nick? Yes, yeah, so, I will. I mean, case loading is part has always been part of the program approval because it was part of the standards for 2009, so mm -hmm. it was always evidenced in the program. Again, many different universities have done it differently. Um, ours, for example, is part of a module, so therefore students have to do it as part of a module. It is a requirement. I think it's an important requirement. Continue to care of features very strongly in the future midwife standards. Um, it, it is a role of a student midwife, and 
again, it is individual to the um, the different university, um, but I think the majority is continuing. I say I know our students are continuing with their caseload, and so that's okay. what I think. Well, that's fabulous. Okay. And I think there was a question about finishing hours. This is from Stacy George Hemes or Hemes. Does this mean that first year students do not need to make up the placement hours? I think I know the answer to that one, <laughs> but I'll let Nikki answer that one. By the end of the three years, you must evidence 2,300 hours of practice. And um, what has been changed with the emergency standard is that it's not even spread between the three years now and um, some universities did it slightly different anyway but it does mean that obviously your practice will have to be um experienced for 2300 hours mm. it's just configured differently yeah i think kimberly holmes was asking a similar question i think what that tells students is they need to really keep a track of their hours that they are doing because they might be finding they're doing the odd extra hour here there and there and they can Keep yeah. track of those, can't they? If it's a third, is that a third year or first year? So first year, first year, first year. So that was a first year question, and I've got to have the caseload. And we've had again, Stacey George Hemes. If the lockdown is eased in the next few weeks, will the first year students be allowed in the placement, or will we stay where we are? That will be um, a decision between the university and the practice partners. Mm -hmm. it, Everywhere is slightly different. Everywhere has been affected differently. Uh, maternity services have, have been configured differently. It really would be a decision at local level. Okay. I'm just seeing if there's any more. Okay, we've had the caseload question. Da, 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 da. Okay. Okay. I mean, you've, you've talked a lot about, it seemed to me very positive, Nikki, about the positive aspects of this. So what are the things do you think, I mean, everybody is saying that when this crisis is over, normal will be a different normal. So which of the, the things would you like to keep or <laughs> some of the things you'd like to keep? I, I think um, some of the, the learning is, is sometimes better online than face-to-face. Um, I, I, I think face-to-face -face has its absolute place and the contact is essential. But again, the innovative ways of doing assessments, how, you know, the support with students that, you know, again, you can maintain support at a distance. And some places have students that travel far and wide to their place of theory. Mm. And again, this has shown that it's possible. So there, I think, some of the things that we would look to retain, I think, and, and explore in a bit more leisurely time. <laughs> and how, and how it, I, I mean, I'd like to know, because I know that on some online materials, you can whiz through in about, oh, 10 minutes, and nothing needs to go in there. It could just pass through how do you make sure they really learned it there is always a thing about authenticity as well with online <laughs> learning is it the right person that's done the other assessments or the yeah the, so yeah. there are ways that we can obviously ascertain that and to assess robustly is one such way um, but yes, yeah, some people do have different ways of learning um i actually asked my team the question about anybody who had you know some particular learning needs and how were they affected because that is something that came up and actually the feedback i've got is that actually this tends to lend itself better because they can change the font they can change the color of the screen they have the time you know the, the information far in advance um again um, um, this is something that we will look to explore and obviously i will explore mm. with our students because things were implemented very quickly as a, as, a, as a requirement now we can start to sort of tweak evaluate refine improve change um as things start to so hopefully things i don't say that it's like saying <laughs> the word on labor world isn't it yes absolutely <laughs> um, how about, how about Jackie? Are there, are there things you'd like to keep? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I mean, and we've touched on this, but I think it's that absolute teamwork and this collaboration. And, you know, um, that's at all levels, you know, from CMO level, 
to health education England and the other four countries all this will you know this this working and, and having to work at speed but coming together to problem solve and I think you know to have that is going to be you know to be able to keep that ethos I think as well you know discovering how you know you can work in that online space um you know quite successfully um that doesn't mean to say we probably never want to meet again <laughs> we do, we don't. but I think it's it's been very interesting how you know we've been able to come very quickly yeah. and I mean um, I mean, all credit to the NMC, but the call centre is carrying on running. So I think for our registrants, they probably, you know, there was very little, and that has to be all credit to, you know, that call centre, Reg and Reval, the IT and people, you know. So that th those solutions had to be looked at really, really quickly to make sure that we still did our, our day job, if you like, because mm. obviously there's still things, and particularly things like fitness to practice. But so I think it's been that very much that problem solving and that very much can do attitude across the whole of the NMC. Um, and the willingness of the four countries, isn't it, Jackie, as well? The fact that, you know, all the four countries have come together, you know, to try and align, to try and get some consistency. The support network has been phenomenal because you are making decisions very quickly and you have to be sure that it's the right one. And to be mm -hmm. able to talk it through with colleagues who are experiencing exactly the same, um, and to talk about the differences, to work the partnership with our practice partners has been phenomenal. The communication mm -hmm. strategy, um, you know, just talking with students, the practicalities, being there for the induction with them, if, you, if it's possible, has really helped to show really what the universities do and what practice do. Because often mm -hmm. people say, what, what, what happens in a university yeah. <laughs> sometimes? And I think it's really highlighted what the different roles are and how they complement yeah. to actually have this 50-50 split, which is correct. Yeah. Absolutely correct. Well, I think this is this has been fabulous, and I could actually sit here and talk and listen to the pair of you for a lot longer. <laughs> but sadly, our time is coming to an end. So I'd like to sincerely thank both of you for your time and expertise and your patience with some of the technical issues, which which are part of a huge part of our learning over the last few weeks getting to grips with these um, online conferences it is lovely to get... just... uh -huh, thank you to get I to know i would just really want to thank all midwives oh, and all students fabulous for all their hard work their contribution and importantly for caring for our women and babies oh you are so fantastic yep. you two we're here You're to so fantastic them. fantastic all I had was a bit of bunting for International Day with some a lovely yellow flowers, some yellow tulips. So I had to wear yellow for the day. So thank you to, to Nikki and to Jackie for joining Pleasure. us for this midwife hour. Pleasure. And best of luck over the next few weeks. And, and to everybody who's joined us today, thank you very much for joining us. This will be available online on um, all good podcast networks and obviously Matflix. And next week we're at our midwife hour, we have Jackie Gerard and Nicolette Peel, who will be talking about the sort of team approach to looking after the team. And because Jackie is into exercise, being an exercise champion, there might be some of that in the session. And Nicolette is <laughs> PBA, so she'll be giving that focus. So thank you very much and take care of yourselves and give your loved ones an extra hug if you can or a virtual hug while you're separated. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Maternity and Midwifery Forum brings you Netflix, video streaming from maternity experts. All your CPD and revalidation. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.